Hi, uh, my name is Christine Hopkins and I am a graduate student here at FIT and I have the pleasure of interviewing Miss June Beauvais who is um, a professor of mine from last uh, year and I just thought that it would be a really good opportunity to discuss her career and some of her life and some of her incredible accomplishments, just some of the highlights. Um, we don't have enough time even in one day to fill it all in so I thought we would just begin with your early life, um, with your family and where you grew up. What year did you were you born in and all of that? My dear, um, I don't add and subtract. <laughs> you can figure it out, <laughs> all right? Because I graduated from college in 1952, and I, you can subtract. However, uh, I do not believe that after the age of majority, people should be judged by their chronological age. Neither did my grandmother. <laughs> and her tombstone uh, has a deliberate error. <laughs> that's a good lesson to take away from this that's, already. <laughs> that, that's right. No. But uh, I grew up in Ridgewood, New Jersey. My uh, parents moved there from Brooklyn in 1932. Mm -hmm. and. I really uh, have uh, lived there on and off and on and off, hither and yon, most of my life. Um, I am living now in the house my parents built there in 1936. Uh, so in the summers, however, we went to see my grandmother, and that was a huge household. Uh, my parents, my great-grandmother, my grandparents, uh, my sister's godparents, et cetera, et cetera. So in the morning, my mother, who just had to go to the beach every morning, and we, we could walk to the beach. This was Long Beach, Long Island, and we were on the bay side, uh, on the waterfront. Um, my grandmother would sit the two little girls down and teach, crocheting, knitting, needlework, embroidery of all kinds, you know, plain needlework and embroidery and discipline. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think today's children would behave the way we did because we did it. And I can hear her, oh, that's a shame. Look at that. You're going to have to take those stitches out. And I did. But, I learned my needlework skills, and they have been part of me and part of my life ever since. Now, my mother made it fun. I made doll clothes for my sister, for me. Um, my mother taught me to use the sewing machine, because when I was 12 years old, I was five foot seven, and the uh, World War II clothing restrictions were on. Uh, and clothing, that long, lanky body was very, difficult. But we managed and I learned uh, to follow a pattern. I learned to sew my clothes. I learned what I liked and didn't like. And my mother would make me look in the mirror and say, look, you have to see the proportion, color, stand up straight. Right? Um, the things I liked best growing up were ballet. Uh, I seriously studied, but don't forget, Maria Tallchief in those days was considered an absolute giant, and I was already taller than she. But I just loved it. And I loved horseback riding, which being a sport for the rich and idle, and being neither rich nor idle, I have not pursued uh, uh, assiduously. Uh, but that is, how, that, that is how I grew up. I grew up with um, needlework, but lots of other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just don't do one little hobby. Yeah. Lots of other things. So I really, think I got a good education, yeah. and uh, here I am. Yeah. So really, even before you were interested in costume mounting, you learned from your mother the skills that would help you 
unbeknownst to yourself as a 12-year-old girl sitting on the beach. Well, you know, I don't think mother was that unusual. I, I think uh, people paid more attention to that sort of thing than they do now. Yeah. You have only to look at the spectacle of spandex <laughs> to understand that form and line and proportion are not always well understood. Yes, that's true. So, um, you said that you graduated high school in the early 1950s, mm, or is that Well, uh, I graduated from high school, I graduated from college in 1952. Okay, so you graduated um, in 1952, and then what was your first career path as you walked out well, of those Well, no, uh, I, I was a literature major, okay. and I was very interested in journalism. I had worked for the local Ridgewood paper uh, for writing high school stories. And I worked for a local Long Island weekly uh, every summer from college, except the uh, junior year when I was in France. And at the end of that, with a French and English literature major and a minor in history, I decided, I realized I did not want to be the next Maggie Higgins of this world. Uh, she seemed very glamorous and exciting to me, but... That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into book publishing. So, um, in those days, uh, the newspapers were help wanted male and help wanted female. And I made a mistake. I went down to American Express and applied for a job they had advertised for, which was only for young men. It could have been written for me because I had the writing experience from the newspapers. Uh, I mean, I, I had worked and earned a salary, uh, and my French at that point was fluent. But it was only for young men. So I worked as a service representative for two years, six months, and 11 days for the New York Telephone Company. And then I put myself through the college women's court at Catherine Gibbs. And then I went out and I interviewed book publishers. And with a Catherine Gibbs certi secretarial certificate, they lay down in front of the door and salaamed. <gasps> oh, yeah. Uh, I, and I did three interviews in Wall Street and where the salary offered was twice what was offered to me in publishing. And I worked for Farris Strauss and Cudahy, um, which very shortly after became Farris Strauss and Giroux. And I decided to take that job because the uh, sales director and the publicity director had been promoted from inside, and they were women. And I never burned my bra or marched along because all of the promotions and recognition of my talent came from men, uh, and they weren't the enemy. That was very rare in those days, though, to have no, a situation it's not like rare. that. No, it was not rare. Is that just the, the lie the, they tell us? Uh, <laughs> the, the, look, uh, things were the way they were, mm -hmm. but um, the early feminists, Friedan, uh, Steinem, what have you, judged a woman's accomplishments by the way men judged other men. What have you done? What is your job? What, ha, 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 what is the... No, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, at one point in my career, had a young man who reported to me who was working, who was making a little more than I was because he had a wife and children. Um, however, uh, I didn't have a tantrum about it. It is true that in the early 50s, into the 60s, uh, if you had a career path as a woman, you had to work twice as hard, and you probably got paid half as much. It's improved, 
but the uh, business of you can have everything and do everything you want was uh, a bit of a fantasy then and it has not panned out. Uh, you have to choose what you wish to do in life. And I've chosen and I've had a very good time. Yes, you have. It was difficult for women back in the, back then, but it was Look, just... Look, it wasn't that difficult. It was. You had to, you know, you had to, you had to get a job. I, I, I didn't suffer. Yes, things, things could be hard, but uh, I think it's your attitude yeah. that makes the difference. Yeah. Because to this, to this day, <laughs> there are people for whom nothing pleases and they spend half their lives complaining mm -hmm. it is a horrible waste of time that's true that really is um, how long were you in publishing for well let's see uh, about six years all, all told real but and it's hard to say because uh, when my first child was born I resigned as subsidiary rights director, but I continued to do work for them, uh, mainly permissions, and also the uh, work on Pollyanna, which I had sold to Walt Disney. Uh, there was a lot of uh, contract work after that, uh, and I came in to do it. And um, so it's, it's hard to say, you know, how, how long actually. but. Everything ceased in 1965. We went and put in a year because my husband needed a year's residency for his doctorate and we were in Cleveland. And that is when I studied tailoring because he would come home for dinner and then he'd go back to the lab. So I, um, I had my little girl. We did everything that was free. I made a lifelong friend from right across the street who also has small children. And um, I, I, I study tailoring. You know, there's adult schools and things like that everywhere. And um, I, I enjoyed it. She sewed too, so you know, it was fun. Good. So you were there for a year, and you learned was some, a year. At some tailoring skills, and and then what? Then what was? Well, the we came step? we we came back to we had bought a house in Ridgewood. We came back, and um, I mean, I had a small child at home, but it was a six room house. I mean, how long does it take you to go through that? So I did community work, mainly uh, the historical society, uh, things of that nature, and um, that is when a local home uh, came into the news. Uh, the last owner had died and this was a historic house. This was a unique historic house. Uh, vandalism was occurring. It was really bad. Uh, the last old lady had, uh, oh she could have sold off property, she could have sold the place, she could have been very comfortable. But she deliberately uh, saved her property intact uh, for the people of New Jersey. And uh, she died and the local police uh, and the local newspapers said nothing of it because her companion, Katie, was still in this old house by herself. And it was very shortly thereafter that uh, Katie uh, was discovered on the floor by the cousin of the last owner who went in every day. And while she was dying in the local hospital, the first uh, break-in occurred and it became horrible. So the local historical society called a meeting of other historical societies and all the other civic groups. And from that meeting, I became uh, one of the 11 founding trustees of Friends of the Hermitage, where Aaron Burr courted the widow Provol. And uh, actually, it's on the National Register because of the Gothic Revival editions 
in uh, 1845 to 48. And then it was the continual home of a family who threw out nothing, including their clothes, for what, 163 years. And before that, it was an um, early stone house, Dutch stone house. So it's a cost so, uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it was it was worth saving, but you know, when I th think back, I think yes, we saved the building. But the most important thing we did was to forge a relationship with the state of New Jersey. Because up to that time, there was no mechanism for a civic group like ours to manage one of their historic properties. And now that is possible, and there is a contract between the Friends of the Hermitage and the state of New Jersey, and the uh, place is being run as a proper museum. And uh, that, that, I think, is the real accomplishment. Now, what I am remembered for is the costume and textile effort, because when we went into that place as trustees and walked around, they, everything had been thrown. In other words, they, in the bedroom, they'd pull out the drawer, they'd throw the contents, and then they'd throw the drawer down and step on it to break. Oh, yeah. Oh. And they tried to ste steal the stoves that were in the um, fireplaces, and they pulled them out, great damage. Of course, they, they, they could not get the whole thing out. Um, the state was very tardy in accepting the bequest. And they finally did. Uh, we had the uh, help of the uh, uh, state superintendent at Ringwood State Park, mm -hmm. who immediately threw a chain link fence around everything, which helped. And then it was a very long long effort, uh, but there was nothing to show the public after all this vandalism, and people were eager to see if we were going to raise the money, we had to have the public involved. Mm -hmm. So we costumed hostesses for very careful walkthroughs of the Hermitage. But what are they going to look at? You know, the average person looking at a shambles just doesn't get it. The one thing we had was the costume which could be mounted. And in every room they could see something that was interesting. Uh, now, in the very beginning, uh, the first month or so, there was a, a lovely lady in Hohokus by the name of Norma Hensler, and she said, what can I do to help? And I said, well, you can be chairman of the costume and textiles, <clears throat> because I have to be a trustee. May I have a drink of water? Of course. <laughs> <clears throat> and she's, uh, she's my friend to this day. Now, she said, let's go to the Costume Society and get some advice, uh, the Costume Institute, and get some advice. So we made an appointment, and I went there. That we went there that day, and we met Stella Blum and Elizabeth Lawrence, who took us through the brand new Costume Institute storage. And I never looked back. So really, I never looked back. It was the Hermitage no. that... And I knew right away, now, um, there are a lot of people who um, are talented and who dress beautifully, but I knew right away that I needed technical and professional background, and I began to, uh, trying to educate myself. And um, first it was Goddard College, and that's a tutorial, a master's degree that's like a tutorial, and Liz Lawrence was the... Uh, uh, was uh, retained by them to be my mentor. But Stella Blum was deeply involved as well. And uh, I audited Rachel Kemper's courses at uh, Cooper uh, Hewitt, 
Uh, I uh, took Helmut Nichols uh, Museum Studies course as an audit, and I worked on my masterpiece, which actually was exhibited in the 18th century woman. It was a, a privately owned dress that um, had been out to the Victorian fancy dress balls, but the whole dress was there, and it was one of these very complicated uh, put back in order. Uh, things. Um, Natalie Rothstein, uh, as a matter of fact, my friend Norma Hensel was visiting England and she took slides that I had taken and made an appointment with Natalie Rothstein at the V&A and so I was able to really get a date on the fabric. And so what I suspected that it started out as a robe la française, it uh, was a uh, you couldn't put it any further back to <clears throat> its last real usage as a robe à l'anglaise, which is uh, you know, 1780s. Um, I had to learn to make fly fringe. And uh, you do something like that, you have to figure out what you're picking out. And I have to thank Nabucco Kajitani, who uh, took out the microscope and analyzed the thread for me. Uh, it was a, a pleasure. I really enjoyed doing it. And the family was thrilled. And it was exhibited at the Metropolitan, so everyone was happy. And um, trouble was that that was took you know, a long time long time because I was in the meantime they began to employ me at the Costume Institute. That was I started out as a volunteer right? but uh, and they wanted me to dress mm -hmm. so, and I had kids at home so I you know I would get the children to school and the sitter for the little one and drive in and of course I only had to go down as far as 96th Street now to come to this place, please. And then for Yeshiva, please, I have to 16th. No, well, never mind that. The driving is, is not part of the happy story of my life. <laughs> but um, I, I would go earlier, and they paid me by the hour. So I started as a volunteer at the 10s, 20s, and 30s. I came when they were taking down Balenciaga, which is Mrs. Vreeland's first exhibition. And I dressed for the 10s, 20s, and 30s. And by the time that was over, they were paying me. And it's really funny. The first contract was a little letter signed by me and Stella Blum. And then it got more and more and more and more complicated. And by 1993, it was pages, you know, <laughs> that you had to sign. But uh, anyway, I uh, I stayed there all those years. I, I enjoyed every single minute of it. You were there from 1972 to 1993. That's correct? right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And in that time, you were able to work with Stella Blum and Elizabeth Lawrence, who you said were your mentors, and they had helped you through the program that you took, the well, graduate program well, as well. Uh, well, well, yes. Uh, in, in other words, you have to, um, if, if you are just working on exhibitions, what you learn are the techniques for that exhibition. And to be professionally competent doing what I do, I feel that you have to have a long view. You have to have an overview. And you, to mount the way I mount, I, and I began to develop what I developed with Liz, and after a while it became my own. You have to understand the human body, the skeleton, the muscles, and the places where fat is deposited. What are the differences between an adult and a child uh, in proportion? And you really have to have that fixed in your mind. 
I don't I tell my students that I don't care if they learn the names of any of the muscles, but I want them to know where they are because that changes the way you put the garment on the figure. The other thing you have to know, since human beings are never satisfied, yeah. you have to know what the people in this era, in this place, time and location, what they did to modify the human body because no one is ever satisfied, ever. Um, Before you began doing the costume mounting, um, was it you sort of have mentioned, you know, you're, you're concerned about your, the body and like the way we tightened it in or didn't tighten it in in different eras. Um, so before you got into the field, were people doing that or were they just throwing well, the I don't think on, I or? don't think that they were approaching it from that direction. Yeah. Um, what they were doing was using paintings and uh, uh, look, there were scholars before my time. Uh, uh, who made a deep study of a uh, historic costume, if you will. But it was from the outside, if you, the way I think of it, rather than the inside out, which is the way I think. Uh, when I was first dressing, um, uh, I... Um, curator or a, a conservator would come with a loan and they would drape the costume loosely on a mannequin and they'd use pineapple cloth or uh, non-buffered uh, tissue and they'd poke it in like this and they'd poke it in there and, oh my God. and it, they could get it looking gorgeous. And about three weeks later, it looked like uh, uh, somebody had hung the garment on a hook because the air goes out, what have you. And more important, there is no support for the garment. So in addition to understanding the anatomy and what people do to it, you have to construct supports from the inside that are archivally acceptable. You don't have to copy the ancient underwear exactly, but you have to make a form that will do what it did and support the antique. Because as soon as a museum accessions an object, it has taken on a responsibility of preservation. preservation. In other words, it is very nice to present it to the public now, but we hope hundreds of years later the uh, museum management will be able to do the same thing. So that's which your... is uh, with the uh, textile not always uh, not uh, always in the possible. cards. Right. So that was your biggest contribution then. So instead of them just draping it and making it look nice for two weeks or three weeks and then deflating Well not you know your... not, not everybody. <laughs> right, but, but the the general practice versus the way that you did it. Um, and continue to do it, which is to ensure that the structure of the mannequin is there with the padding, um, to add the bust, to add a little bit of stomach on the woman, a little bit extra hip or what have you, maybe a man that was a little overweight, um, you know, adding that in to you keep want, in mind. You want right. me to tell how, how you do a man? Yes. Yes, I would All love right. that. <laughs> you see, I tell my students that, you know, a woman gets these roles. Now, with a man, you put your finger right on the end of the breastbone, the sternum, and you think avocado. Okay. All right? There is not a separate roll that flaps on the side, but in the front, it's this way. <laughs> uh, which was actually rather fashionable uh, during the 18th century. <laughs> Oh, yes, you see the portraits in there. <laughs> yeah, they, that's true. Young, handsome men. Yeah, absolutely. 
Oh yes, and also the shoulders seam is up here, is 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 here. You know, the, the man's shoulder is in the top of the sleeve. Yeah. And um, until maybe about Civil War, the epaulets on a military uniform are this way, and now they're like this because of the cut of the clothes. Yeah. And the way we think a fashionable man ought to look. And take a look at the um, uh, plates, uh, fashion plates of the 1830s. And the men have a nice wasp waist and a lowered sin. Yeah. yeah, the fashion plates really help you. Flash, look, fashion plates are the ideal. Mm -hmm. Photographs are the ideal. And of course, uh, fashion photography is different now. Yes. Um, up to the <clears throat> end of the, well, the last part, latter part of the 20th century, uh, you could really see the seams. You could see how. Uh, mm -hmm. No more. It's art. It's an art. And it shows the idea of the garment. Which is, you know, which is, which is fine. A barbier in the uh, 19-teens uh, actually did the same thing. Um, I, I've heard it said that, you know, it's a reaction to photography that could give you the details, and he gave you the ambiance of the period, which, which is true. But you have to go, you, 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 so you have to examine several sources. And not, not always is, are, are you able to find many sources. The further back you go, the more difficult it gets. And the scholar who really analyzed such things in depth was Janet Arnold, um, who, who understood how the body works inside the garment. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, there, there, there were others. Um, uh, Doris Langley Moore in England. Uh, she, of course, uh, famously uh, put out uh, two, two books, two of her publications, where she took uh, pieces from her own collection and put them on living people and photographed them to show how this piece from 1835 looked on a living person. Of course, we do not do that now. No. Uh, and, and for good reason. Yes. <clears throat> because uh, such things are becoming uh, rarer and rarer. And uh, there, the stress uh, of wearing is the stress of um, movement and the uh, heat of the body. That's why for a garment that has been worn and worn, there are no more really straight seams because the fabric has been distorted by the stress and the body heat. And other things. Yeah. Well, so every costume has its own challenges and um, questions that are to be answered before being properly mounted. Can you tell me of a time that you, your most difficult mounting ever? What was a costume? Oh, that's, that's hard to say. It's like asking me what my favorite period is. It's the one I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> um, I think for, uh, um, just difficulty it is anything that is deliberately outside the human f form. Uh, it's hard to do Issey Miyake when a model walks down the runway wearing it. It's, but it blurs the human form. Right. And it's very hard to set that up. All right. 
but the hardest one. Uh, there was a, a, a man, and uh, he's an artist, and uh, he is uh, Jewish. So he has made, <coughs> along with many other works, uh, two costumes, one for himself and one for his wife. One he gave to the Jewish Museum, uh, uh, and one he gave to Yeshiva University Museum. And they are amuletic figures. Now, this is an art form. <clears throat> now, the man, which is, was given to uh, Yeshiva University Museum, uh, is blue with white. And the woman, which was given to the Jewish Museum, is white with red letters. The entire surface of the costume uh, is painted Hebrew characters. Uh, it's amuletic, all right? And everything is covered with the exception of the tips of the hands. So they're a cover for each foot. Uh, there is uh, a trousers for the man and a long skirt for the woman. Um, and, you know, there's a, the jackets and the overlap. Then there is a hood that covers the face, and there's sort of a grating of uh, that. In one case, in the man's case, it's like sewn tapes that are like a mesh that you look through. And then for the woman, it is a white veil that goes down over her face with the red characters painted on it. But he's an artist. He had this vision. He did this. They are frightening when they're mounted. And he <clears throat> made it so that he could put the clothes on his wife and himself. <clears throat> but they're not quite properly proportioned. Now, he has pictures of both of them wearing it, like this, arms up, and then the man has a sword. There's several pictures like this. But as you look, <laughs> you, you see that there's something that, not, not, not the... Um, characters on the fabric, that is incredibly uh, interesting to, to look at. I mean, they're striking. Put that together, try to put that on a mannequin that is the form of a human body. And it is very difficult to figure what they did here and what they did here, uh, plus the fact that neither one of them was a tailor. So, you know, the way the zipper goes in and the way they're, they're, they're hard. Those, those things take a long time. And um, I had the man <laughs> once, what is that man? No, I had the woman once, all set up. And this curator came through and said to a technician, oh, well, I want the arms out like this. Of course, they did not, did not understand what a mannequin is like, so they cracked both shoulders. And I had to come back. At my per diem. <laughs> I wasn't very happy. But, I mean, these, the, these things happen. <clears throat> that's, <clears throat> that's difficult. Yeah. The other difficulty is extreme fragility, where... If it were really up to me, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't dress it. Yeah. So. But there are things that people have insisted go up, even <coughs> if they're <coughs> a date that maybe you don't oh, it, agree with. It always happens, or there's uh, there are interpretations. Uh, I, I will not mention the museum, but there was this one garment that they insisted was for a man. And it was sort of a tunic. And they had the man's form there, and I did find, eventually get the thing on it, and I objected and objected and objected. The neck measurement was 13. Hmm. What man do you know has a 13 neck? No. 
And uh, that, that, that is where you can run into to difficulties. But when I go to a major museum, they know exactly what they want. We have discussed the problems. I, I go in there, I do my work. Yeah. Smaller institutions, uh, when I say smaller, I mean your local historical society, uh, your little community museum. First of all, I'm giving them a either a friendly um, price or pro bono. Now, they want to get everything, everything that I can possibly tell them. All right, out of it. I mean, because particularly if they're spending any money. Um, but they, uh, it is difficult for them to understand that they have to follow the advice. Particularly when the founder has given them his grandmother's dress. And it's probably not his grandmother's dress. The date is absolutely awful. It may have been his wife's. <laughs> he never noticed her wardrobe. <laughs> but the, the date has nothing to do with the dress, all right? And then you have to tell them this. Do you break it to them gently? <laughs> and, well, yes. And I go into a situation like that, a small museum, even, even if they have decided and they've contracted and they're going to pay me this. I am a friendly colleague, and we want to work together to get this particular thing done. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the whole conservation profession over the years, with the very best of intentions, has too often told the very people who have managed to save these important artifacts that everything they've done is wrong, they're ignorant. They've done this horrible thing. Oh, come on. Listen, the big museums of this world have pulled their own share of boners. And the whole thing is to, okay, it happened. Get it right. Yeah. You, you, you don't have to lay people out cold. And that is how I, I, I can think of, of uh, instances where that very thing has happened. Yeah. So, anyway. Well, going... That keeps me busy. I, yes, you definitely have. I, I do less of that now. I mean, mainly it's the transportation, which I'm beginning to hate. I don't blame you. Traffic around here isn't fun. Um, going back to your time at the Met, you mentioned Mrs. Vreeland or Diana Vreeland, and... Um, she was there at the same time you were. What was it like working with her? Well, uh, first of all, <clears throat> I, first I was a volunteer, and then I was uh, paid to, and that was Stella Blum and Elizabeth Lawrence. Uh, they made those, those arrangements with the management. <clears throat> but it was Mrs. Freeland's um, exhibition, and... I think I really came to her notice uh, at the time of the Russians when the Russian curators uh, selected me to Mount Catherine the Great. They were watching what everyone was doing, <clears throat> and I got this summons. I could see them. <clears throat> I was, I'll tell you what I was doing. <clears throat> The trains for the court dresses went out like this, and that meant that a piece of muslin had to be put underneath every single one of those trains. And I had, we had permission to tack them in um, because <clears throat> just arranging them on the platform it was... <clears throat> so I'm sitting there, and I had these... Plastic, you know, the plastic gloves that come out of the box that are big like this? Because mm -hmm. it was silver tissue. Yeah. And, of course, underneath, you, you know, you, you could take a stitch in the lining. <clears throat> but 
Where do you put the thimble? I, I, I can't sell without a thimble. I, have, I was forced to <clears throat> inside or outside, and the thing slips. And, and so I'm in there, I'm sewing like this. <laughs> now I look up, and there they are, the three of them. The three Russian curators. Yeah. And then I got this summons that I'm to come in to see Stella. I thought, what have I done? They're going to throw me out. <clears throat> no, you will mount Catherine the Great. And that was, I designed those mounts from the ground up. I had to use a size 14 um, mannequins. And because at that time, if it was a historic figure, the Russians would not mount it with a head. Why was that? Well, uh, to avoid the cult of personality. Ah. Uh, Peter the Great, they had his uh, coat, his boots there, and what have you, but he was never shown with mannequin with a head, nor was Catherine the Great. Mm -hmm. They were on dress forms, and of course that meant you had to make a thing for the arm, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> the poor woman suffered from dropsy, you know, edema. And the two dominoes, uh, that of course is the dress, the, that refers to the uh, long ceremonial coat with, with the pendant sleeves. Mm -hmm. You see that would go over the back. In the back, her dresses had silk ties because when her ladies dressed her in the morning, uh, of course, you know a corset never is that, uh, laced like that. There's always, well, they would adjust it. And then they would adjust the dress and then they would put on, she'd put on the domino, which was a mm -hmm. s ceremonial dress. And then there was the famous green uniform. And I did, uh, you know, I, I, I did those three. And after that, um, Mrs. Vreeland herself would call for me. And I think I explained to you, I always called her Mrs. Vreeland. Uh, my grandmother uh, was a proper Edwardian. And I knew everyone wanted to be very, and they called Diana, dear Diana. I never called her Diana. I called her Mrs. Vreeland and she caught it right away. So, I, the first time I saw her, and when I saw her working, I knew this is not a curator. Remember, I had been in the book publishing business. Mm -hmm. This is an editor. I know how editors work. Um, I would, she'd call me, this is a little, and I'd say, Mrs. Vreeland, please tell me how you see this costume, this dress. Oh, woohoo! And she'd tell me with her arms and her hands. She's a very articulate woman. She knew exactly what she wanted. And I could say to her, I understand that will be fine. Um, I could say, I understand what you want. And I will try that mannequin that you like. But I don't think it's going to work. Let me see what I can do. And then we'll look at it. I never had trouble with her. I never, and, and there there were people to whom she was very imperious, and um, I I didn't have that I didn't have that experience. I saw her in action. I saw her in action. Uh, oh, yes. Not something you wanted to be in front well, of. Well, no. It, it, actually, if she'd said those things to me, uh, you know, it treated me like that, I, I don't think that I would have confronted her, but I wouldn't have gone back to do something for her again. But luckily, you knew how to address her and well, you it, know, had a different it relationship. Wasn't, it, you know, it was, uh, you know, uh, look, I did every mount for costumes of Royal India, and that was just before Joel Cuneth came, thank God, because we worked together then. 
Um, and um, I spoke to her on the phone just about every night because she was not well then. She, she was... She was having difficulties uh, then with her health. That was, you know, to more to the end of the 15 that she did for uh, Costume Institute. I spoke, with, I spoke with her every night. I told her what I was doing with the um, dresses with the, it was, there were skirts and uh, trolleys and orkneys, um, you know, but with the heavy hems, you know, and how I wanted to work this out. Um, and, you know, a big exhibition like that is a very cooperative effort. But my part, my responsibility was figuring out each group of costumes, how you get them on the, on the mannequins. And uh, it, was, uh, it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. I had a wonderful crew working with me. So you enjoyed working with Mrs. Yeah. Freeland then? You had a good relationship? Yeah, I, 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 I liked her. I liked the way she looked at things. Yeah. And remember, <clears throat> very senior scholarly curators, not just at the Met, but all over, were absolutely horrified by her. <laughs> but she created a whole public for the appreciation of costumist art. Yeah. And some of the things she did along the way were a bit outré. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, um, what were your most memorable exhibitions that you worked on, either with or without her, while, um, during your time at the Met? There were two. Um, of course, I was there for the 15 that she did, and then there were some after that. Um, <coughs> I did, <coughs> I was Liz Lawrence's assistant for um, the 18th century woman. And Liz was, uh, I realize, now dying. Uh, she died shortly after that opened, but uh, the night that she would have gone around to see every costume and, and put the last few touches in, she couldn't get in, and I had to do it. And that was very sad. Mm -hmm. She was my mentor and my dear friend. Um, that, and, and it, it was such a beautiful exhibition. And the pieces there were wonderful, just wonderful, and from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, the other exhibition that is memorable for me is Costumes of Royal India <clears throat> because I, I was uh, designing the mounts for that myself. And Mrs. Mehta, Zubin Mehta's uh, um, wife, uh, sp learned who I was and spoke to me and she said, thank you. Uh, because you have brought out the beauty of my country. And she said, you know, uh, my country, all you see in the press are the photographs of the famines, the plagues, the f fightings, the insurrections, uh, the poverty. And she said, uh, my country is also beautiful. And this is that meant and still means a great deal to me. And uh, that's beyond the interest in costume as art and costume as history and et cetera. Um, uh, that, that is beyond that, and it's very telling. I remember that. So those are the two I remember the best. And usually um, what I'm working on is what uh, just consumes me at the moment, but those two stand out. Okay, well then, you've had many, many years in the industry and mounted many costumes. I, can't, I don't even know if you could count them if you tried. But um, some perspective on the industry that you have is obviously going to be different and very in-depth compared to a lot of other people in this field. And I was just wondering, in your eyes, what makes for a successful exhibition? 
Well, it depends <clears throat> upon the venue, really. A big museum, large city museum, that is one thing. But what makes a good exhibition for the historical society, for the historic house? It's not that it's different. I think the attitude has to be the same. I mean, I think you have to be truthful. And for, for someone like Alexander McQueen, in the beginning it is clothing, but as it progresses it is art. Mm -hmm. And I think the Metropolitan as an art museum did a wonderful job with him because that is who he is. He is an artist in clothing. Yeah. Okay. Um, then it depends upon the mission of the museum, what large or small. Um, is it an art museum? Is it a history museum? Uh, you, it's hard because sometimes they try to be all things to all people. But uh, I think that a very successful, uh, quite long exhibition is the First Ladies at the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. Because they have respected the history, they have divided up uh, the way these women impacted society in their time as it goes on. And it becomes different. Her, her role becomes different. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not just her clothing. It is what she does and how she influences. That, that is very much in the, uh, uh, you know, it, the mission of that museum. Yeah. And if the, muse the mission of your historical society is the direct history of your era, then you have to put it out in, in the most attractive form you can. But you must be truthful. Mm. And uh, when I see uh, a costume, uh, I will tell you, and I don't think I'll mention the place, but there is a university that has a marvelous costume collection. And um, there is a, um, one of these villages in my state. And so they, had, they borrowed an exhibition from this college uh, to emphasize the Downton Abbey era because that is part of what they emphasize. The, of uh, 1910s, okay, 1920s. Well, they had store mannequins that were, I suspect, six feet tall. <laughs> so not, not... Dressed, you know, a la... <laughs> so you have this very, Dante like, Abbey. artistic... Gorgeous, absolutely beautiful beautiful costumes and there wasn't a stitch under those costumes so that the here's the bosom of the store mannequin and the 19 oh, what, powder pigeon hanging down here and um, other excrescences uh, really bad I mean really really awful bad <laughs> um, now the public thought we're fascinated. I mean, you see very, very beautiful uh, costume of other eras, and it is fascinating to see, just, just to look at. This has absolutely nothing to do with the era. It doesn't even have anything to do with what these poor people in this village are trying to show people. It's awful. But when, when it's that bad, it's a lie. And sometimes, you see, it's not that bad. 
sometimes it's just pretty awful. <laughs> but that one was especially awful. That one, that, that one was really, really bad. <laughs> well, um, now we have the spectrum. We have the worst and we have one of the, the best examples. Um, you have worked with many people at the Met and you've worked at many, with many people at other institutions and you know you had your mother and your grandmother helping you with your needlework in your childhood. Out of everyone that you've worked with and has been part of your life, um, who's had the biggest influence on you? Well, obviously I have to say my mentors who were Stella Blum and uh, Elizabeth Lawrence. And then I have admired student work. I've admired Anne Bissonette, and I have admired Helen Capodistrios, both of whom graduated from this uh, program, uh, who went on beyond what I ever taught them, and brilliantly so. Um, other people, uh, I greatly admired Sylvia Her Herskovitz, who has retired now as director of Yeshiva University Museum. Um, but here is a woman who, yes, she had generous donors, but she built that effort. And she always strove for excellence. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing. Uh, you see, I'm never satisfied because I always think it could be better. But I think that's what you have to do because you have to get the best out of yourself to show your artifact best. Yeah. Um, and you've just mentioned one of the other institutions that you've worked at. You've consulted with many other institutions over the years, including the New York Historical so Society, the New Jersey Historical Society, the Jewish Museum, the Morse Museum of Winter Park in Florida, the Merchants House of New York City, um, among many others. What types of jobs do they bring you in for? Well, uh, a, a place like the Jewish Museum or the New York Museum wants me in there to mount three-dimensional uh, objects. And this is not necessarily always costume. Or um, if it's a combination, there are some small textiles, um, you know, that need to go into a case, you know, I, I, they go along with the three-dimensional, I'll do the whole, all, all those. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have mounted costume for the Jewish Museum for a very long time. Uh, and it, what happened was uh, they called the Met, and I was recommended. And I went up there, and uh, I just clicked with Vivian Mann. She, she's a, a, a real scholar. And uh, she, uh, I, the first thing I worked on was the Tale of Two Cities. Uh, and, of course, uh, that was the... That, that was the one where, one of the cities, of course, is Istanbul. Uh, uh, <laughs> in those days, I'm very fashionable. I had those um, trousers on that are like Turkish trousers, you know? The harem uh, pants. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm standing next to the rabbi, which was borrowed from the Smithsonian, uh, who also had shawar on. And the bride, which is wearing a bendali, and I'm fixing the top like this, so it looks like three figures. And all of a sudden, I hear the door click. I'm in the case. And Lamar Terry, who's doing the lighting, is on his way to dinner. Oh, no. Now, they had cleaned the plexiglass. I was like, yeah, Lamar, Lamar, let me out, let me out. Oh my gosh. He, he, for the longest time, he said, you know, I kept hearing something funny. He kept, well, they had to clean the plexiglass again. I'm sure. They weren't very happy with me. Well, I'm sure you weren't very happy I wasn't very there. happy to be locked in while you had to do it. So it worked both ways. When, when I worked there, you see, I would be working at the Met, so I do it evenings and Sundays. Yeah. Um, 
earlier you had uh, spoken to me before we were recording about the Morse Museum and how you were brought into that. Can you tell everyone about how that came to be a part of your... Uh, which, uh, uh, which one? The museum and the Morse Museum. Oh, oh you mean yes. the Morse Museum? Yeah, the Morse. yeah. Oh, yes. Well, uh, there is a family, mm -hmm. uh, the grandfather, the father, the, right? but it's the Charles Hosmer Morse and his wife, who was a great influence, their daughter and her husband, and the granddaughter and her husband, mm -hmm. um, who are responsible really for what is the uh, Morse Museum in Florida, which of course has the wonderful uh, collection of, of Tiffany. Yeah. So they uh, finally, when the last person of the family died, the trustees found themselves in possession of their personal effects. And um, Judith Eisenberg, who uh, has been a professor here for years and years, and is an uh, independent uh, uh, conservator in private practice, um, she, uh, a friend of hers heard of it. Uh, they were casting around for someone to look at this. Mm -hmm. So she went down to Florida to look and found costume. And so she said, come. <laughs> and I came. We have done three exhibitions for them. Yeah. And uh, uh, of, of the clothing, and because you can see in this uh, clothing from three very well-to-do women, uh, a personality. Uh, for instance, the uh, earliest lady, uh, we had her hats, and there was a hat exhibition. Now, in the 1880s, there were many forms that were popular. She liked the ta this tall little bonnet. Well, they were there from France, from Chicago, where they were based, from other places, and actually from Florida. Beautiful, beautiful things. Um, and uh, in the archives, of course, were letters and the way that she allowed her daughter, and you can think about when, uh, the 1890s, to go abroad to study by herself. Right? Uh, these w were women very much interested in art, very, and they loved Winter Park, and finally the family really settled in Winter Park. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things is that they had um, the museum is a separate building, of course. Uh, they had a house on a lake there. They had several houses there. But this one uh, was retained, as I say, until the last person died. And when the trustees went in, they found this nice rustic place completely furnished in stickly. I mean, the stickly. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes. And when they were going through, you know, closet by closet, up in the top of a closet, never opened, were two of the curtains that Stickley designed to go with his furniture, which are now textiles very carefully hung in the <laughs> main part of the museum. But it's a, it's a fascinating place. And uh, the last uh, lady uh, married uh, uh, a man who was, uh, he was president of Ron Rollins College down there, mm -hmm. uh, actually. But he had been one of Tiffany's uh, students, you know, the apprentices that we'd taken. Mm -hmm. So he maintained a connection with the family and the night Laurelton Hall burned, he had a telephone call from the daughter. Well, he and his wife went up there, and they filled trucks and railroad cars with everything. The rubble, the 
crashed pieces, what have you. And they have installed in that museum, in addition to a wonderful collection of 20th century artists, pottery, and paintings, um, the uh, chapel that was installed in the Columbian exhibition, uh, exposition uh, in Chicago in 1892 uh, and 93. And then it was translated to the uh, uh, croft, under croft of St. John the Divine. It should never have been put there. It was not a good place for it. So uh, Tiffany had it at Laurentian Hall. That, that was the one, two, third installation. And of course, in terrible condition because of the fire. The whole thing, including the chandelier, which is called the Lightolier, and it lights up and it's colored glass. Oh, wow. It is incredible. And you see these panels of, of the altar, and off to the side is the baptistry with the famous window that is all lilies. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible that they have completed that, and they've completed the daffodil porch. Uh, you know, and it's, I did, did see one box, <laughs> there's pieces. And they just put And they've been together. at it for all these years. So, uh, I, we've done three exhibitions for them, from the clothing of these ladies. That's really fun. Um, so, You've helped mount many historical garments from people that were just very wealthy and had a fun treasure trove of things, but you've also helped and mount things that are very famous, including um, Empress Elizabeth of Austria's uh, oh, corset. Oh, yeah. Elizabeth of Austria and Napoleon, and yeah. <clears throat> well, and that was the Habsburgs at the Metropolitan. Uh, and it was that was a very interesting exhibition. So <clears throat> the the garment itself meant a great deal to the uh, curators from the uh, Austrian Museum. Uh, it was very special to them, and it was mounted on a pillar uh, on a torso form. Uh, it was it was very very interesting. Uh, she she was so athletic. She was the first um, celebrity health nut. <laughs> she, she rode horses every morning, and I mentioned her to my students with Eugenie, uh, uh, Napoleon the Third's uh, empress, because. They were celebrities, both of them. They both influenced fashion enormously, and they were different. Mm -hmm. People forget that within a particular era, there are differences. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I set it up. Well, it was a, a matter of uh, making sure that the form was exactly and it was a little hole, not like this. And the assassin had stabbed her, but she was wearing not only this, and which it was boned, but it was not the bone of the bodice. The, he got a hole right in. It, he hit one of the uh, stays in her corset and it ran along that before it went into her. So she survived for a while. You also, you mentioned Napoleon as well. Well, Napoleon, uh, yeah, that was a wonderful time in New York. It was uh, 89. <clears throat> and there was a wonderful uh, 18th century exhibit, uh, loans from the uh, Kyoto Costume uh, uh, Institute here at FIT, and then if you went uptown to the Metropolitan, there was the Age of Napoleon, 
which of course is the very latter years of the uh, 18th century through uh, into the early 19th century. And one of the things that was to be exhibited was uh, Napoleon's coat. I mean, it uh, came from his years in exile. Um, and it is owned by the Musée de Sens uh, in Sens, France. Uh, the stipulation was that uh, it come back conserved and with a uh, mount that they could put it on. Uh, Cara Varnell was uh, specially hired as the conservator for that exhibition, and I was assigned to make the mount. I also mounted his great coat from Fontainebleau, uh, the green court costumes from uh, Italy for the Italian coronation, uh, and um, of course this coat was very, very important. And so I had, <laughs> I had to make the mount really without actually trying the coat on. So it was because Kara had it laid out and it did have serious moth damage, mm -hmm. particularly in the shoulders and various other places. So I would hold the measuring tape over the piece. And I wanted to do it from the inside because that is where my uh, structure would be. So I then finally, uh, I, I came up with a uh, many tries. I, I used um, dotted Pellon first. And um, I came up with an exact replica of the inside of the coat in muslin, and I used that to dress. And I think I showed your class the pictures of that. Yes. Um, you, you have to know your, your, your subject. Um, so I looked at pictures of him throughout his life, how he stood. Uh, the other thing is that it published, there is an autopsy. So I knew exactly uh, how tall he was. 5'7". You don't think of him as 5'7". Uh, his wife, Josephine, was tiny. She was petite. But his garde républicaine were all made up of six-footers. And the cartoonists of the era, and let's face it, uh, most of the other countries had uh, not a very favorable notion of Napoleon because he was conquering them and invading them. Yeah. Um, and so the caricatures were really uh, <laughs> nasty. <laughs> um, everyone thinks that he was so very, very short. Well, we had the uh, uh, Lefebvre portrait. Uh, and so I had a slide of it, and I projected the Lefebvre portrait onto a wall until I had him five foot seven. And I had the proportions for the buttons on his waistcoat and the pocket flaps and things of that nature, which I made. And uh, so he was all, all set up. And uh, you know, then the thing from, the, the coat from Fontainebleau came in and we waited and waited and waited because the uh, stuff from Italy got stuck in customs, which was really very annoying. But we got it all done in time for the opening. But I am fond of saying that the only women who know more about Napoleon's body than I do, have been dead for about 200 years. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, uh, yes. Well, you dressed enough of his pieces that uh, I, you probably are not wrong about that. <laughs> um, so after this lovely, illustrious, colorful, fun career that you've had, you 
decided to sort of switch gears a little bit and you went into teaching and you are still in teaching. Well, actually, I never switched gears. I just added on. <laughs> Can't slow because down. Because <laughs> uh, somewhere around 1991, Margaret Ficioris was teaching here and wanted someone to do three-dimensional. I had no idea that she really knew my work. But when someone of that distinguished stature calls and it goes like this, you come. <laughs> so I did, and I've never left. I never left. I, I really realized that I could teach what I do. And you see, when you work for a, an exhibition, you only learn the techniques for that exhibition. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're an intern, you know, and I've had many interns. But this way, I could present what I do uh, to students and present the philosophy behind what I do. Right. Uh, so that, that's, that's how I came. That's how I came here. I have also been very active in the Costume Society and... Um, was one of the founders of the New, New Jersey uh, Costume and Textile Group uh, because my state of New Jersey uh, is really awful when it comes to the arts. Uh, not the performing arts, but the other arts, oh dear. Uh, and, you know, from the back in the dark ages when there were people who did not consider costume pieces as art, and hardly as history. Um, the poor lady who found herself in charge of costumes and textiles at the Historical Society was the one who was unfortunate enough not to go to the meeting, so she got appointed, and was be trying to do her duty <laughs> and needed help. And so uh, we... We had uh, meetings throughout the state, uh, still do occasionally. Uh, there's much more material available now, and you have uh, things on the internet uh, that were not, uh, which was not available to anybody when we started out. Uh, we had to explain what a primary source was. Um, and as a matter of fact, Gail Alterman, who now is curator at uh, Cranford, and who is a colleague of mine for many years, she volunteers for me at YUM when she can. Uh, she, uh, we, we asked her to, to uh, do a bibliography for someone living in my state, uh, of primary sources you could look at. This is before you could, and let's face it, you can go on the internet, but it's going to cost you, and a lot of these places will not spend the money. Mm -hmm. uh, the library is still a very important resource, very important. Yeah. Um, the, the, other th the other thing is that you don't get, um, the whole run of uh, a publication very often. Yeah. Uh, yes, for 20th century, you can look up Vogue and Harper's, and you, you know, that, that's, that, is, that is not too, too difficult, but um, try, try 1810 sometime. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, okay. Right. So uh, that is that is still that is still an important uh, uh, contribution, and the costume society was the other thing besides being you know all those years working for the Metropolitan, uh, it was easy. To, uh, people you know would call up and I'd be referred. Um, it was costume society because I was there at the symposia. And um, I did, would do demonstrations of what I do. The last one was 2010. And, um, and that's right before you I, were... I, 
yeah, <laughs> that was, um, uh, well, actually, no, that wasn't the last one. I did one a little later, uh, just last year. I did um, just one era. 2010, I showed well, you know, my philosophy of supporting from the inside and how you can make these things and how you put them on. And always a barrier between the piece and the uh, mannequin. Um, but um, I, I did the uh, umpire period uh, just to show what what people did in the era to modify the human body and how it comes out and how it is necessary to do certain things when you dress it. So that was fun. I enjoyed that. I still do that for them. Well, you mentioned that you would at the Costume Society give presentations on your philosophy behind costume mounting. Well, I did a lot. No, there's this National Symposium, which is once a year, and that is mainly papers, and they do have a professional development uh, uh, segment uh, where there are demonstrations, mm -hmm. which is what I would do. Right. Um, but I did a lot more uh, regionally for the um, mid-Atlantic states, which is, you know, of course, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, down, uh, uh, you, you don't include Virginia, but you, uh, you get down as far as Washington. So you, you've had a far reach on showing people your methods. Um, do you think that uh, that has changed the field? Like, now that people are learning, oh, you can't just drape it, it has to come from the inside. Do you think that's well, I, changed you know, the field at all? I am hardly the only one. Of course not. But it has been, that has been my message. And I think that the field has grown. In other words, um, uh, there is a woman by the name of Helen Alton, and I took one of her programs at one point uh, at AIC, um, who... She's an objects conservator, uh, but was troubled by what she saw quite a number of years ago in the way costume is mounted, particularly in smaller societies. Mm -hmm. um, and so she has d developed this. We're, we're very much on the same page. The emphasis on anatomy, which uh, I insist on, uh, I don't think is as strong in other places. For for instance, uh, uh, the Flecker book, uh, uh, Laura Flecker uh, from um, uh, the V&A. That's a wonderful book. Uh, of course, everything she does is sewn, and you really do have to have real skills, mm -hmm. sewing skills, to 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 use her method. But she's wonderful. So, you know, there's, there's always more than one way. But no matter what way you take, your first importance is the artifact itself. Mm -hmm. And the clue, you can go to as, as many books as you want, but the clue is in the artifact itself. That's the ultimate clue. Do you think that that's been... Um, one of the improvements that's come across in the field is that people are paying more attention to that now um, than they once did. Well, I think, it's, I, th I think it's a dual thing. There is more interest in costume just as costume, or dress, if you will, um, from a number of points of view. First of all, uh, Dionne of Vreeland had an enormous influence in showing costume as art. And you, you can't, no matter what she did, you can't get past her attendance figures. Mm -hmm. And I think she stimulated other museums to put more emphasis on their costume collections. Um, I, I think it's been done in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Great Britain. I think it's been done in France. And frankly, all over the world. Look at the Kyoto Costume Institute. That was just started as a study in Western dress. Mm -hmm. 
and they they have one of the world's finest collections. Uh, we have had a student here, I think more than one, from Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stella Blum, oh, way back when, went to Australia and uh, did an exhibition, which is 1909 to 1929, I think, uh, with uh, pieces from the uh, Costume Institute. Um, they, she went, oh, Stella and Liz Lawrence went over to Japan several times and uh, did things with the uh, Costume Institute there. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that generally also um, you have a whole underground network in vintage clothing mm -hmm. uh, where uh, people wear it and then you have the phenomenon you know you put all your stuff in the bin at the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. It gets transported to Africa and they take these pieces of clothing and they don't look at them as pieces of tailoring. To they put them together in other ways. So there's, <clears throat> and of course, there's always been a, a market in used clothing but clothing as history, as art, as culture, as material culture, that's what people are more and more interested in now. So that's been a really big improvement then, is that it's gaining more respect in the museum field. It's not just taken to be something like a fluff piece in a museum, like because of things like Mrs. Vreeland, people learned that it can be art, and it is art. Um, well, that, uh, well, that is that is an art museum, and, and yeah. don't forget that the Costume Institute started as the Museum of Costume Art, and was taken into the Metropolitan mm -hmm. as a full department. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for instance, long before Mrs. Vreeland came, I, one of the uh, I I was not uh, in, involved in this way at all. I saw the exhibition when the Reisman Rooms opened and the 18th century costume for men and women were in the rooms and it suddenly gave a human dimension to those huge rooms. And the, those, that was actually dressed by uh, uh, Paul Lair Weitzman, Stella Blum, mm -hmm. people like that. Yeah. Um. Are there any changes that you've seen that haven't been beneficial? I know technology more and more is becoming something that museums really like to integrate into museum well, culture and atmosphere. Uh, not beneficial, I, I can't say that, but I will say this. Like everything else, there is fashion, and it changes. And there, there is museum fashion in <laughs> the way costume is presented. Mm -hmm. uh, over the past numbers of years, uh, the idea has been that you just abstract the mannequin and there is the costume floating in space. And the point is that you really want the public to look at this piece just as the artifact itself. Nothing to distract. And that works to a certain point. And it also works with certain designers. With Charles James, for instance, it works very well. However, I just finished reading uh, the biography of um, um, Millicent Rogers. And in that book, there are a couple of pictures in her, you know, she uh, had many Charles James dresses and that uh, all went to the, to Brooklyn. And so they're, no, they're here, they're, yes. they're here in New, in, in at the, at in, the, at, at the uh, Metropolitan. You know, I have seen these wonderful mounts for the Charles James dresses, and I have enjoyed them thoroughly. Mm -hmm. 
but you know when you put the head and shoulders and the arms coming out of one of those dresses and the head is the top of the silhouette the, it's marvelous it just just in that photograph I'm just looking uh, the other thing is that uh, oh I have done so many headless wonders I cannot tell you but if I can, I always like to have one at least fully realized mannequin because the line and the form include the head. Now there was an exhibition at the Metropolitan not too long ago where an uh, artist came in and created the headdresses for uh, all of the uh, mannequins as separate recognized pieces of art. And I particularly didn't like the 1890s up to about 1910. Um, I thought that you could not see the silhouette. And in those eras, the silhouette is so important. Mm -hmm. And they had the big lumps. Their heads were big lumps like this. And I really didn't like it. Uh, I know that the fellow is a talented artist and I'm sure he's done other sculpture that uh, perhaps I would enjoy very much. But I didn't enjoy his headdresses. Because the artifact is the most important thing. Now they have this gorgeous dress beautifully mounted on a mannequin and then you put this thing on the head and all the public can look at is the head. Yeah. So that's my prejudice. So a good a good head is better it's well, gonna I have like, a bad head. Well no it's head at part all. <laughs> is part of the silhouette, yeah. which means that there's the hairdressing and the uh, hat headgear or whatever was worn at the time. Yeah. Um if we could time travel 20 years from now, uh, where do you see the field progressing to? Like, Do you think there will be vast changes Time travel now 20 years from now? Yes. Uh, listen, I have <laughs> two seven-year-old grandchildren, uh, and uh, all I hear is Star Wars and Captain, <laughs> Captain uh, you know, what is it, Star Skywalker? Please. <laughs> all right, uh, the Legos all have claws. Oh, my. Yeah. 20 years? Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? Nobody knows. But I do think that the costume holdings in museums will become more important. Mm -hmm. But I think that there will be fewer museums that are able to sustain the cost of maintaining them. So that you will have um, perhaps thinning of collections. And I wonder... Uh, about the judgment any time uh, in thinning uh, a collection substantially. Yeah. Uh, you always have to deaccession some things. But I, I think that the cost factors will become such that um, academic institutions uh, right now uh, so many academic institutions have given up their uh, costume holdings. Many, many. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shippensburg is an exception because they are growing. But uh, the great land-grant universities all had what used to be called home economics. I believe it's now human ecology. Anyway, uh, those those collections are uh, or have been endangered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the major institutions will keep on. There will be some that grow, mm -hmm. but 
I think the I, I think that the collecting will be private collectors. Yeah. Who some some private collectors are purer than Caesar's wife. Um, but a private collection is a private collection and they do what they do they, with it. It is theirs to do with. Now, I believe strongly that if they lend to an institution once that piece goes over the doorstep, it's treated as a museum object. But when it goes back to the uh, lender, the private collector, uh, then it is it is their uh, responsibility uh, and their function. Their, they have their reason for collecting. Mm. So that um, oh, just uh, just just look at the. Um, uh, Auctions, yeah. Karen Augusta. Wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Look how many deaccessions there are. Yeah. Eat them through. Now, some are from private collectors. There's, there's always been a market. Yes. Uh, one of the most responsible, of course, is Tiddy Halley at Cora, Cora Ginsburg. Um, and that always has been very high end and creme de la creme. Uh, Cora herself was very kind to me uh, with my uh, costume. Uh, she she helped me. I took it over there. She looked it over and gave me her opinion. Um, that w was very nice of her. Yeah. Uh, and she has been very generous uh, with the, the Graduate Studies Division. Uh, and Titty has too. So, <laughs> there's the vintage market for secondhand clothing that people wear, all the way up to a place like, <laughs> like Laura Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. um, and that will always be with us, but I think it'll be more important because I don't think that institutions mm -hmm. will be able to, um, main, except for the very big ones, maintain the, uh, the cost. Yeah, it is very cost. Yeah, it's, it's not just housing the artifacts. Mm -hmm. It's paying the people who have to take care of them. Yeah, it's true. Well... Let's hope that there will be fewer deaccessions than not, and that maybe that won't be the case. Um, but uh, we'll see. We will yeah, see. We'll see. Um, I would like to wrap it up just with a little reflection on your career. Um, in 2011, the Costume Society of America named you a Fellow of the Society. Yeah, and that was the greatest honor of my career. Yes. Sort of the... Well... I, I appreciate that very much because um, the founders uh, of the Costume Society were really the movers and shakers of the field. Mm -hmm. And so the early nominations for a fellow uh, really were the founders of the, uh, of the, cost, of, of the Costume Society. Yeah. And because I had never really held a national office, you know, except for being on the National Endowment Board. Uh, I, I just never th thought, and you have to consent to the nomination. And then there is a period, a good period of a year that uh, uh, they go into details of your career and uh, people who've known you, uh, that sort of thing. And um, I was really very flattered and uh, very honored uh, because uh, it was because of the dissemination of my uh, methods and the support for uh, dress as a respectable independent discipline yeah. that I was given the award. Well, congratulations and 
It's very well deserved. Um, are there any things in your career when you look back, like you've just done so much and you've spoken to some of the more difficult uh, mountings that you've had to do and challenges that you've solved throughout time, but is there anything that you did that you look back and you're like, oh, if I could do something over, that would be the thing, that would be my, my redo? Um, no, not really. Uh, because I think you have to make decisions um, with the knowledge you have at the time you have to make the decision. And of course, uh, I have had a family to, uh, to take care of, a household to run. Uh, I have other interests. Um, and um, yes, perhaps I could have forged on more professionally, but I did what I wanted to do. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it would be, uh, uh, you know, ver very nice to uh, travel to places to work for them. Um, you can't do that when you have uh, other responsibilities. Um, perhaps I could have uh, instituted a uh, studio of my own, the way Judith Eisenberg did. Mm -hmm. uh, but look, I don't, I don't think that I wanted to do that. I, I'll tell you, it would have been very, very nice uh, in the early years to be able to travel. There was no internet. I was very, very interested in uh, the 18th century corset and the way it was misunderstood when I first started out. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of work. I did as much as I could. Mm -hmm. But I could never afford, well, the money was, <laughs> I could have, I think, squeezed that. But the time, yeah. I, you know, I, I couldn't put it all together. I would like to have gone, uh, really uh, taken a survey, S sort of what Claudia Kidwell was able to do with the short gown. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the stays what you have in American provenance are a bit different from the ones that you see from England. Yeah. And I think that's a very nice topic for somebody's thesis. <laughs> you got the internet now. I mean, you got all the you know, push the bio and the picture comes on. <laughs> There is a qualifying paper idea for anyone that's listening to this right there. Uh, my final question will be, um, because you have done so much and worked with so many different institutions and mounted so many different famous pieces, is there any project out there that you could fabricate in your mind that you hope happens or that you would love to be a part of that's maybe already in process? Anywhere in the world, like money's no object, travel, family, anything you could, uh, you could go anywhere to do something. What would it be? Um, hmm. Now that's that that is a, that is a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I've stumped you once this whole time. <laughs> I never, no, I never, you know, quite saw of it that way. Um. Oh, I don't know. I, I would love to see some of the earlier pieces, um, 17th century, because mm -hmm. there are survivals. Yeah. And uh, I have practically memorized Janet Arnold's texts <laughs> on them. Yes. And um, I even have a collection of uh, hand irons, you know, and I, I have made those frilly things with starch. And, mm -hmm. That's fun. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would like to see all those things, those Swedish things, you know, they kept the, the uh, king's clothing mm -hmm. back there. And there are many um, examples in uh, Great Britain, uh, France, Italy, mm -hmm. that would be fun. But, uh, you know, I don't think I'll go out and make that an, an aim. Um, <laughs> I kind of take things as they come. Um, I like dolls. 
Yes. The, the old ones. Because I started out when I was in junior high school making doll clothes for my little sister. That's right. You said that you had the book where she was dressed for a hundred years, you said it? Kitty. Her first hundred years. Cannot remember the name of the author. And it's about a little doll made of wood. And it tells about all the people who owned her for the first, for the hundred years. It's as though the doll is writing a diary or a biography, uh, autobiography. And then with each episode, there is a picture of her in the costume. It's a drawing. Yeah. And I made them all. That's so fun. She was in her Tahiti. She had a grass skirt. <laughs> she had a hoop skirt wedding gown. She was, oh, yeah. That's really fun. Well, um, is there anything that you would like to share in your mind before we Well, I yes. Uh, yes, I would. Uh, what keeps me coming here are the students. You're getting better and better. And uh, I would like to see my notions disseminated uh, to respect the artifact, and I think they do. Uh, I don't think that all of uh, uh, all of the all of the programs uh, teach uh, from the artifact, and I think you have to you have to consider that if you that that is what the museum's responsibility is, yeah. and then from that. There are other areas where you can go. Right. No, no. What keeps me coming here are the students, not the West Side Highway. <laughs> well, speaking as one of your students, I am forever grateful, and I know all of your former classmates feel exactly the way I do. And I thank you so much for sitting down with me. And I know. Oh, this has been fun. It's thank you for coming down the West Side Highway for this. <laughs> and I hope that um, you know this is something that everyone will listen to and well, have a great experience like we just did. I just want you to did. go, everybody, to go out into the field and to find the things that interest them the most and to keep at it. Well, you've helped many students do that. So oh, we thank oh, you. Oh, yes. We yes, thank yes. you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.